Learning Lisbon Print, we've started many years ago with our first conference in 2008 in Barcelona and this one now in Cambridge with a lot of help from BPIF and from Cathy to organise it. It's important to move forward the young printers because our industry is facing enormous challenges and you need the young people to think differently and to think out of the box. Today's conference is really important because it brings together young printers from all over Europe in order to exchange knowledge, talk to each other and learn from the speakers, the valuable speakers we're having during this conference. Welcome on behalf of Intergraph and thank you very much to Cathy and BPIF for organizing um, this wonderful seminar for those two days here. We're really excited to be here. For those of you who don't know Intergraph, Intergraph is the European Association representing the printing industries the European Association for Print and Digital Communication. We have 24 member associations throughout Europe in different European countries and we're based in Brussels. The reason for being based in Brussels is so that we're close to the European Commission, the European Parliament, so that we can make sure that the concerns um, and interests of the printers are listened to and heard in Brussels. The other of our tasks is the exchange of knowledge throughout Europe. So that's one of the reasons why we're here today, because um, exchanging knowledge, making printers from different countries talk to each other, this is um, what this meeting is all about, and learning from each other. Um, and this is why I'm so happy to see so many of you here today. And I'm really looking forward to two fruitful days of discussion and, and interaction. I've been writing about this industry for about 30 years. And in that time, I've covered pretty well every bit of ground there is to be covered, I guess. I, I was there when they launched the Apple Mac in the, in the Mermaid Theatre underneath Blackfriars Bridge. Long since disappeared. So if you want to know about technologies that no longer exist, I'm your man. <laughs> but I'm also your man for technologies that are coming, that are emerging, that are here that potentially have opportunities to change the way that printers do business, that printers print, that printers create new value-added products. So I'm gonna be around here for today, during the breaks, this evening and tomorrow. So ask me anything. Okay, people, technology and responding to a changing world, Cathy said to me. Just come in and talk about that for an hour. You won't need many slides. I've got 53, so <laughs> we, we, better, we better get cracking. Whenever I'm in a process of sharing or whenever I have the opportunity to share, I always come away with more than I bring. We are all in this together. Um, as an industry, it won't be changed by extraordinary examples um, in isolation, but it will be changed by us all collectively doing the right thing and saying the right thing. We need to create a collective voice which underpins and underlines the value of the product that we produce. And we need to change the way that we do that. And I'm going to share, share some of my thoughts on that as well. The things that I've done and the things that I apply are really straightforward and everybody in this room can apply them. Um, and if you do, um, it's my belief that you can find success. There's nothing extraordinary about precision printing. What changed for us is that we moved into digital printing and it was uh, relatively uh, an overnight success. We went from one press to two presses. Uh, and over the last uh, six or seven years, um, our digital business um, has grown to where it is now, which is around eight million pounds in value. And in doing so, we've pretty much tripled the size of our business. We actually process 50,000 individual orders in a single day. And the average order value of those orders is just £2.30. But from our little base in Barking, East London, um, uh, we, we are now a, a global presence. And there's a lot of uh, nonsense spoken about new media. You know, we've all heard things, tweets will replace conversation, all print will stop in, in two years, direct mail is a thing of the past. People simply don't follow the same decision-making processes that they did previously. Well, 
That's a load of rubbish, I'm pleased uh, to tell you, for my benefit and for your benefit. As an industry, we should just keep calm and carry on. Our product still works, um, but the way that people order it and the way that we have to receive those orders uh, is, is changing beyond all recognition. Now, we're lucky um, because um, we're printers and um, when adapting to a changing world, we're, we're used, to, used to doing that. And because we change and we innovate, things that have been around and the very latest thing before, uh, they come and go. But our media doesn't. And uh, the reason for that is because we're constantly uh, moving forward. But we do have a challenge. Uh, and the challenge for me is the way that we talk about our product and work, the way that we communicate um, uh, its benefits to our customers. Printing for a long time um, has been very much focused on the how. So we talk about running speeds, dots per inch, ISO this, ISO that, um, color gamuts, a whole range of things which are really important to us um, but are not important to our customers. And what we need to be understanding much better than we do today is why our product works, why it works and where it works best. Because it's undeniable that printed media connects with people in a way that other new media simply doesn't. It's emotional and it has an emotional connection. And because it has that connection, it drives action. And that action is what our customers are looking for. It's the action and the outcome they're interested in, not the way that we produce it. And we could all do well with thinking about how our marketing messages and our imagery uh, connect with those people. So what we're doing at Precision is to work on, uh, work on our messaging um, and uh, the way that we position products and to make our language um, softer and more emotive. So we talk about personal and not personalized um, and real-time agility. We want to be dynamic and innovative and go beyond, uh, go beyond direct mail. We didn't come up with anything which was particularly radical. To start off with, we just did the things that we were told. We listened to what the manufacturer said and they said, do variable data printing. So we did. They said, do web to print. So we did. They said, transfer these type of jobs over into digital. So we did. There's nothing that's necessarily radical, but we just listened to what they told us and we applied it. There are a few secrets that I'm going to share with you, which are really simple things and they're things that anybody can do. Um, but in my experience, not only in my personal experience, but also when I look at the people that progress within my own organization, these are the traits that they demonstrate. And it isn't about being clever or smart or understanding more than anybody else. But secret number one is tenacity. And this is, this is a really big thing, which is you know, just because something doesn't work, you don't stop. Um, and if anything has got me uh, or, or along the road, um, it's, the, it's the ability to just, uh, just keep going. Secret number two, do the hard work at the right time. This is one of my favorites, and, it, and, it's, and it's the secret to opportunities. Take them. When an opportunity presents itself, take it. Um, often I find that people talk themselves out of things, so they can see it an opportunity is there, and they will find 10 reasons not to do it instead of the one to do it. I can make more money by sharing that than I could ever do by keeping it to myself. Thank you. We're looking at the future and looking at trying to predict how change is going to affect our market. How electronic media, how digital media is going to change and the impact of print. My role is to develop market, to look for opportunities for print, to support everybody that's in the industry. Work with some of the bigger global brands that are out there and understand what the predictions of change are and then give that information to you so that you can use that in your business approaches to actually help predict the change to you and your organization. But the one constant thing is change. We're all changing. So what we need to do is look at it and say, okay, how do we take the information that we get from companies like ourselves, from people like Gary, 
and then build that into our business approaches. Everything now in digital is about data. And it's the way that we look at data and the way that we actually analyze it that makes the difference. I'm just going to give you four things to consider. But the first thing is really focus on those applications and look at how applications will develop in a digital environment and how those, in, uh, interact, those applications will interact with big data. The next bit really is to then understand the growth areas and plan for them. Marketing services is one of them. The more we automate the processes, the more we can do. And Gary's an example of that. Get mobile and social. I would encourage all of you to create LinkedIn, Facebook accounts. Use it in an interactive way. But also analyze what's going on in the social area as well. Actually look at what other people are posting and what they're doing so that you can then do that as a little bit of market research as well. And the last thing is, is really to work as a community. Share experiences between each other, work within the advertising area as well, work within industry, create communities, do networking, and, and do as much as you can in a way where it actually gives you a balanced insight into what's happening. Now, uh, probably what I should do to begin with is just say a few words about myself, because if I don't, there's always people sitting there thinking, did he referee the last World Cup? So I just want to get that out of the way to begin with. And um, one half of what I do is I'm a writer, and for about 20 years I've had a regular column in The Guardian, sad, lonely, balding male, seeks similar woman. <laughs> Not that kind of column. I, uh, I write about business, and I wrote the office politics column in The Guardian for many years, and uh, because I have a day job, I used to write that in my lunch break, which I took between 10 and 4.30 every day. And um, when I was writing about business in the papers, I thought to be taken seriously as a writer, I'll need to write a business book. So I, uh, I wrote this business book, there it is. Double your salary, bonk your boss, go home early. I completely misjudged the entire business book market. I didn't realize you had to take business seriously. I wrote this book called Never Hit a Jellyfish with a Spade, and I'm very pleased to say that was a number one bestseller in the small area around my mother's house. <laughs> and, but the reason I'm here today is my day job is I run a company called Smokehouse, and Smokehouse is an innovation agency, and what we do is we help very large organizations usually think differently about things. So we help them innovate, come up with new ideas, new products. Everybody says they need to innovate, and I'm sure you all work for companies that say, yep, innovation is one of our key priorities. Probably your boss says to you, yep, you've got to think differently, innovate. But people generally don't do that. And this is why people don't try new things. Try something new, massive disaster, immediate sacking, marriage breakdown, alcoholism, prostitution, drug addiction, death. Okay, so that's why people don't try new things. But this is a really useful chart because if you want to do new things, you have to start at the bottom and work your way back up. Now this is the uh, main thing you need to know, is you can't solve a problem with the same thinking that created it. That's uh, Albert Einstein, after a heavy night. And, uh, and what I'm going to do now is tell you and uh, share with you the three basic rules you need to innovate. Often the first thing I have to do is tell people to stop. Don't start, stop. Stop what you're doing and think. You now have permission to look at what you're doing and think differently about it. Hands up if you know what lateral thinking is, or you've come across it. Hands up, lateral thinking. Okay, so not very many of you, which is good because it doesn't work, right? So lateral thinking, and it's a big, big thing, lateral thinking, is you, instead of solve, um, thinking about your problem head on, you start your thinking somewhere else and then bring the uh, thought across laterally. But um, can I tell you what normally holds people back? Is that you're doing sensible jobs and you've got deadlines and people and stuff, and it's sometimes a bit embarrassing to say, well, how am I going to solve this complex process by looking at a teaspoon? And that's called the embarrassment factor. But it always works. So if you can get over the embarrassment of stopping and saying, I'm going to think about something else, it will always work. If you can get over the embarrassment factor. Can you imagine you're single, okay, still, or again? And... Um, you have to write an advert for yourself in the newspaper or online, and you can only describe yourself using three brands. So, if you had to pick three brands to describe yourself, what would they be? 
So they can be cars, they can be clothing, they can be shops, they can be leisure, they can be teams, they can be food, they can be wine, they can be jewelry, whatever. Because there are brands out there that express every side of everybody's personality. And um, when you use brands, they mean something. If you think with a brand, you've already got all this thinking done for you. So always in a session, I will pick the brands that are furthest from the problem and say, guys, I want the body shop solution. I want the um, Samsung solution. And people will know what that thinking is. They just have to apply it. So get yourself some brands and think differently about your problem. And you know, in English, we say, are you on the same wavelength? Because actually, the wavelength that you think really does change if you think in a different color. So I will, whatever problem we have, it doesn't matter whether it's on pensions or uh, landing craft, I'll say, okay, I'm gonna divide you into groups. I want the pink solution from you, the gold solution from you, the black solution from you. And automatically, when people have got into that color, they will start thinking differently. And always with colors, I always found that was a very good way of getting myself somewhere new very quickly. So if you've got a really complex problem, just think through the rainbow. Think, right, how am I going to think through this in different ways? And it will put your brain into a different place. So that's lateral thinking. It always works as long as you don't go for the obvious connection and you get over the embarrassment of actually doing it. So you give yourself permission to do it. It's a really good idea to swap worlds. So, um, for example, if we wanted to um, change hotel rooms, so we wanted to revolutionize hotel rooms, we could just pick one of these at random. And um, so, for example, we picked flight. What could you take from the world of flight? So when you walk into an airport, there's a whole load of things you don't notice because you always see them in airports. What could you take from an airport to put into a hotel meeting room to improve it? If you're talking about printing, you know, what can we do from take from medicine to talk about servicing our clients better. And you'll know all these things. So it's uh, taking one of these worlds, something perhaps you're interested in, like uh, construction or railways or whatever, and taking all those ideas that you already know and putting them in a place they haven't been put before. And I would say 90% of what I do is taking old ideas and putting them into new places. So if we had uh, 20 minutes, I could get you to write down the 10 golden rules. This is what you need to be a successful print uh, business guy. Here you go. Take it away. Good luck. Yeah, you'll be able to do that. So write down your golden rules. You know, what is it we're doing? What are those golden rules? And then try and break them. Change the metrics. So you're all measured on something. Just change what you measure. Okay, that's a pretty straightforward one. Every one of you has a mental map of your job. And if I ask you to draw your job, you draw it in different ways. It'd probably be a bit of a chart, maybe a little mind map. It would all be different. And uh, the quickest way of changing your thinking is to redraw your map. Draw your business and then see if you can redraw it. And be careful of mind maps. Does anybody use mind maps here? Just one person. Be careful with mind maps because when you draw them, you're just printing out what's in your mind already. It's the white spaces in mind maps that are interesting because that's, that's where the uh, new ideas are. If you wanted to stop people smoking, I don't know why they put warnings on them. People never read warnings. They should make them pink or they should make them less attractive or they should make them short and stubby or they should make everything about them, the aesthetics, unpleasing and uncool. But at the moment, they're beautiful. The shape of the packet is the golden, golden mean and... Uh, that's a beautiful shape. And that's the emotional space around a product. And often, if you're competing really hard on cost, it's the emotional space around your, how you make people feel about doing business with you, which is the great place to innovate. And I just wanted to finish in the last five minutes talking about something completely different. And I thought, I know I'll write and direct a film. We've got this stately home in the village, so I wrote it to be in the stately home. So we had a stately home, that's fine. But the one thing I needed was a Red Arrows fly past. Then I learnt that in innovating, what you think is going to be the most difficult turns out to be the easiest, and what you think is going to be the easiest turns out to be the most difficult. So I phoned up the Red Arrows and I said, uh, <coughs> excuse me, making a little film in the village, can we have a fly past? And they said, yeah. And they said, well, we, we're going to fly over, we're going to come into Bryce Norton on June 21st at 7.34. Is that all right for you? And I said, fine. And uh, I looked 
uh, they wanted them to fly over the stately home. And I looked in the diary and there was a wedding on. And uh, they were the only couple in the Western Hemisphere who thought the Red Arrows were an instrument of fascist oppression. <laughs> and didn't want them at their wedding. And, uh, you know, but it was their wedding, it was their special day, and we had to respect that. And um, I only wish somebody had told the Red Arrows, really. <laughs> <laughs> But we got around that, but it just shows innovation, things come out of the left field, and they, they you know, but uh, we got there. And um, this is us, this is the, in Leicester Square, this is our film, and um, we took the whole village up there in 10 coaches, and um, this is our poster there, and we'd spent all the money, the villagers, we raised the money ourselves, and um, we s were suddenly told at the last moment, if we wanted one of these jobs, these massive posters, it was going to cost us £10,000. They printed out all the tickets. They gave us the spreadsheet of all the seats in the cinema. And um, the lady who was an ex-accountant, retired, she looked at all the tickets, she looked at the spreadsheet, and she said, there are 10 seats here that don't have tickets. And we went back to the cinema and we said, um, if we told you something that would save you approximately £1 million over the next 10 years, would you pay for our poster? And they said, well, we don't believe you, but uh, yes. And so we said, you haven't got tickets for these 10 seats. And they looked back at the records, and they hadn't been selling those seats for the last 15 years, which is the length of time they'd had that system. And that had lost them something like £1.2 million pounds worth of revenue. And uh, as good as their word, they pay for our poster. So the lesson I learned from there is if you stare at a spreadsheet long enough, sometimes beautiful things happen. Once you decide to do something creative, you have that vision. If it's a good thing done in the right way, you will get there. It might not be the way you think you'll get there, but you'll get there, and along the way, you'll find out some very interesting things about yourself, about your company, about everybody who does it with you. But also, it's great fun, it's a great challenge, and it's worth doing. So the last thing I wanted to say is, first of all, thank you very much for paying attention. And secondly, give yourself permission to do things differently. Thank you very much. be talking about paper and I'm pretty passionate about it. I've been in 33 years. My father was a paper maker. Frederick Only Group, we're just celebrating being 125 years old and the turnover of the group's around 800 million this year and it is a global business and I think that's really important. The product range we sell, we just couldn't do that if we were only selling in a few markets. We have to sell it on a worldwide basis and that's what they're really good at. And I think that's the impressive thing to me that in a market which is trended down, Frederick Only Group has managed to grow every year and we should be uh, well over 800 million in, at the end of this year. So continuing to grow in what is undeniably a shrinking market. And I think it's um, really the speciality market is still there. And even to an aspect when people are not printing so much, when they print something, they want to use something really good that stands out. So that seems to... I've been saying that now for five years, so I guess it is partly true. That's part of the thing that's helping us. The top end is still pretty strong because of that. Uh, we have to put interesting collateral in front of designers and printers uh, give people ideas about using our papers and we've continued to do that and uh, I think having a faith in marketing and uh, promoting that side has been really key. So said we're, we're back in the trend I think with this diverse product range having our own distribution companies we're very close to the market we know what's going on we don't sell through third parties and we have great customers um, and our, our customers are good because they're in the right sectors as well. We work with Premier who are really good at um, Indigo Papers, got a very good digital team Work with Gould, who are very strong in, um, in greeting card business, working where we do work with distributors. They have niches and they're very strong in their areas. And we have a studio in London. You're very welcome. It really is a drop-in centre. There's lots of events there. So it really is a, an open house and that, that works very well. And uh, again, I don't think anyone else is doing that at the moment. 
Um, so, but we have to look at the fact that you know, paper consumption is in structural decline. There's good reason why paper consumption is going down. And unfortunately, we're in it together because most of the paper people produce is printed. So if that's in decline, then you know, both industries ha have some issues. But it's not all bad news. As I said, you know, there's, there's ways to fight back. I think imaginative use and paper and print are what's going to save us and, and save this industry. But you know, paper has got a life. Um, and 75% believe that paper is more pleasant than other media. Well, you know, and people all the time, the tactility of it is, is still attractive. And people feel comfortable with paper records. There is something, I, I don't know about you, but whenever I put anything on, a letter, you know, you think, am I going to lose that? You know, every time my computer doesn't start up properly, I think, gosh, I wish I'd back that up. So paper will play a, pay, a, a part in that. And it's certainly still a trusted medium, and that's what we need to take advantage of. But I think the good news is general commercial print packaging still pretty strong. I think uh, the stats on, on what's happening in the print market probably also uh, bear out what we're finding in the paper market. Uh, it's clear there are good sectors out there and we are certainly going to focus on them. Quality is always in demand and that gives you a premium price. So we, were, we are in that sector and we will stay there. A diverse range of products and services we offer, I think probably even easier for printers for that. And I'm sure you've talked about that. And I think it's inevitable that there will be a consolidation of the industry. Um, capacity will have to be shut. Um, and it's happened in America. We normally always follow what goes on there. And I think that's what will happen here. Um, there will be some consolidation of the bigger users and, they'll, uh, and the capacity will be adjusted. Um, so hopefully there's enough positive in there to, to get you thinking. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. So I want to give you a glimpse of the future. To recap on what printable electronics is. The layers in printed electronics are, as the name suggests, added by printing, but there's still a lot of vacuum processing. So silicon processing, it's expensive, whereas printed electronics can be relatively cheap. So what's the big deal? Why are people interested in printed electronics? Well, it's a new way of applying conventional print into new markets. A lot of applications, displays, packaging, brand awareness, solar cells, medical, smart cards, brand protection, smart textiles. It's early stage, it's a diverse industry. ID TechX say that if you go and buy a product in the printed electronics industry now, it's a bit like going into McDonald's to buy a burger, to be told that they'll give you the gherkin, and they'll send you down the road to get the cheese, you'll go somewhere else to get the bun, and then you have to assemble it at the end. That's the kind of stage we're at. But what we're trying to do in this industry is build the supply chains needed to give you the product you want at the time you want it. Integration is very important. The future of printed electronics is, is now going to be about taking what we can do at the component level and integrating these devices together and integrating them with the environment. Basically, what it means is the whole environment can become part of your internet. So great potential. Why aren't we all millionaires? Well, materials problems, that's the cost of the ink at the moment. We've got to commercialize and scale up. Moisture, air stability of the materials. Some of these are solvent systems, so people are working hard to try and find aqueous solutions. Um, and durability, I've mentioned, uh, along with the barrier development. And we think that the future, as far as we see it, is built around continuous processing, low-cost ultra-barrier, and integration of components with themselves and with the environment. And if you get it right, anything is possible. In terms of targeted marketing, what does it mean? Um, what influence and what impact will it have on us? Richard Branson's view on it is we need to understand what the individual likes, wants and needs if we are going to present our solution in the best way and maintain our brand integrity. And the critical element for me is the individual likes, the wants and needs. If you don't understand how a customer wants to be communicated, what their preference is, what the priorities are, how are you going to give us, deliver something that's via, at the right time via their preferred channel and giving them relevant content. You might understand the customer, you might understand what they want. If you don't give it in the right tone of voice, with the right associated messaging, with the right associated images, it will fall flat. So understand your creative, watch your brand, and make sure the tone of voice is, is absolutely uh, applicable to that individual.
we've got to get the channels to work harder. So clean the database, make it more relevant, but use the most applicable channel that's relevant for that customer. All of these are communication channels that the customers are taking on board and leveraging. Consumer trends have changed. Consumer behavior, purchasing behavior has changed. In 1998, 2000, if I was to buy a plasma telly, what would be my thought process prior to purchase? Hearts rule the head. They're not, it's a subjective purchase. It's, it's not something that's, that's really well thought out. I feel that that's the right product to buy. I feel it's the, the right manufacturer to buy because of the subjective information that I'm aware of. And it's a single trip. You go into the shop, you maybe have a demo, talk to the sales guy, you'll buy it there or then. So your awareness, it's advertising, it's direct mail, might be telephone, might be some point of sale in the store, and it's word of mouth. This year, there are thereabouts to do the same purchase. There's a significant power shift in a way that information is available to make you more informed, the purchase is more complex and it's more divided. You've got multiple channels, multiple locations, and competing messages to buy the same product. It's push, it's pull, and it's peer-to-peer. -peer. Brands are still pushing that message to you, but you can pull information. You can go onto the internet, you can do research. You know, the network to be able to capture information is far greater, and the peer-to-peer -peer is, uh, is certainly there, certainly via social network. Quick summary, content is the king. Consider the data. What do you know about that customer? What don't you know? What, what attributes can you find through other external sources of data? That information is out there and you can capture it. Once you know what that customer's trends and their behaviours are, hit them with relevant content via the relevant channel. And don't just distribute it as a single channel, it's multi-channel communications. Make sure you're having one-to-one -one communications with your customers, not just blanket messaging and hoping it's going to work for you. Build loyalty. Customers will buy from brands where they're loyal. You've got to build that loyalty and make sure you drive it hard. Uh, the conference has been great, a great mix of variety of ideas of innovation, digital printing, just lots to take away with us. We enjoyed the conference uh, and uh, we enjoyed the relation that we made with other co foreign colleagues. Great insight into the printing industry, which is what young beginners like myself need. Browning was uh, his innovation talks were really good his techniques were really good and made you think outside the box which was uh, which is really good and I'll definitely take some uh, some of that uh, advice and thinking away he really made me think differently about the way that I approach marketing and the way that I think about ideas The graduate management programme so far has been a real challenge. Uh, it's nice to get into other areas of our business that I wouldn't normally have access to. I'm finding the graduate management programme quite engaging. It's, it's definitely helping with my personal development. It allows you to ask the right questions to the right people uh, and, and find out a lot about your own business as well as other businesses around you.